Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers. At the end of the episode, we will have a short story from a Twisted Reunion. That short story is Group Session. Going back to my first, well, it's not about my first therapy session, but I think that's probably what sparked it. And that was a super helpful therapy session. I didn't go to a therapist. Well, I went to some family therapy early on. It wasn't for me, but I probably benefited from it as a when I was a teenager. But then when I was married in Vegas, I did, I think it was only two sessions I did with a therapist, but something he said to me, like, man, I think within the first 10 minutes, just the one thing he said to me about me being a perfectionist, that was a big step in the right direction for me. So you know, I'm a huge fan of therapy. Don't let this short story fool you into thinking otherwise. Speaking of therapy, damn, I could probably use it again. Now, this, that's what this is for. That's what. That's why I do the podcast. It's also why I do social media and videos, but I haven't been doing those. And I also haven't been working out. So <laughs> that's been going on for a while. It's all tied to the kids being home, me being lazy, not eating right, I'm out of alignment. A lot of reasons why. But when it comes down to it, it's like, okay, if I don't like this, then I need to fix it. Right now, though, I'm super productive. Whatever time I'm not spending with the family, I am spending time on trying not to die. So a lot of that was getting back at grandma's house ready. And then this past week was getting Wild West ready. That is now up on Kendall Bella. So both of those actually are on Kendall Bella. But Wild West just went up. I think only the first four episodes are up. And I'll release, I think, three episodes a week for the next four or to five weeks, and they'll be finished. And then a month after that is when the Kindle version will be released and the paperback. So I will be spending time getting preparing that paperback. Shouldn't take very long since the book is already completely edited, ready to go. We just have to do some of the back matter, all that kind of stuff, and formatting. So that's no big deal. But again, it takes time. But then after getting that done, I switched to Death Fest. And for a little bit there, I was actually, and I said, I felt terrible. I sent Glenn a message saying, hey, man, we got to change the way we're doing this. It's taking too long. I was like, then I looked at it. I was like, fuck, we're doing actually great. I have so many projects and I'm bouncing all over. I kind of forget where I'm at with different things or I'm not putting enough effort into one. Just letting it sit. I've done that with plenty of books. But with Death Best, I went back into it. I was like, oh, shit, we're nearly done. I'm going over the final seven chapters. Glenn and I just went over a couple this morning, had an awesome talk. And uh, yeah, so I think that one should be done. So I'm going to send him chapters 16 and 17. As soon as I'm off of this, he will have those back to me. And then there's just four more chapters. Should only take me a week to get those done. And then those will all be edited. Meanwhile, the first half of the book has already been like a nice, really strong edit on it. Now I'm giving it to the editor for the final edit of the first half of it. And by the time Glenn and I are done with the second half of the book, which should be about probably two weeks. I'll give that to the editor. And then Glenn and I will be finishing up the death scenes. We'll be able to run that on Kindle Vela as soon as Wild West is finished. So that's awesome. I kind of like having this as a way to test out the book, just to fine tune it. Like, cause I feel like, okay, I can make some changes. Whatever's not working exactly right in the Kindle Vela version. This gives me time to reread it. it. Gives time for readers to make comments to say, "Hey, you know what? What about this? What about that? What about? I, I really like that death scene. That death scene sucked. You know, so that might influence things. But I like having that extra time to put together the death scenes and the paperback and just not be so rushed. So I think that's the new approach. Is just going full speed on whatever book I'm on until that part of it is finished. So with this one, with Death Best, I'm going to stay on it until those 1 through 21 are done and it's ready for Bella, so, which is really, really soon. As soon as that happens, then I switch to Ghostland and I'm going to do all that. In the meantime, there are other chapters that have come in, like I just got the Dark Fairy Tale from Evan. He's probably going to be finishing his, his main story in a couple of months and I still haven't edited very much of it but the nice thing with his is it's going to be really fast so that one is going to be more of an edit i'll put it into shape we'll be able to get that on on kindle bella and then take time to develop all the death scenes with him so that's where we are at with that process definitely consuming a lot of my time i don't really have time to do much other writing oh this is how i spent new year's day it actually worked out great so i'm not bitching about it and i'm very proud of how i handle it because one of our cats was sick you guys don't see him in the photos very often he's my nighttime cat blue he's white but he has blue eyes awesome cat my son loves him but he only comes up to me pretty much at nighttime must always sleep on my chest anyhow great cat 
and he'd been kind of he hadn't been eating we were a little bit worried about him i think it had been two days that he didn't have any food we didn't know if he'd had water he seemed okay to me but my wife and son were very concerned and they wanted to take him to the vet so i was like okay we'll do it on new year's day so i called and they said it was going to be at least three to four hours and i told my wife and she's like so of course i went because i'm happy to do it and then it ended up taking six hours and it cost about seven hundred dollars so and i think he's going to be fine but i'm glad that we took him and the really cool thing though the reason i was able to wait six hours at the animal hospital is because i had death fest with me so that's all i was doing i was forced to write i often force myself to write when i like i'll go into the sauna and the only thing i'll take is my writing it's like okay shit, i'm forced to write i have nothing else i can't go on my phone I can't go on a computer I just got to do this because this is all I have. So at the doctor's office, that was nice. I had my phone on me at the doctor's office, but I didn't check it probably for like a good solid three to four hours. I was only writing. After that, my brain was pretty fried and then I did some German and stuff like that, some brain games. But yeah, six hours on New Year's Day for a cat. But it was worth it. Got a lot of shit done. And that's why Death Fest is about to be finished. So, well, at least the main story, the Kindle version, that is about to be finished. The rest of it will take a little while, but it's all good. There's no huge rush. And whenever it comes out, it will be fine. All right, guys. So I think I'm just going to keep this short, just as I've cut a lot of stuff with social media, freeing up my time. Like, you know what? I'm kind of all out of stuff to say. Maybe I could think of something else. Maybe there's something really cool I could share. I don't think there is. I think the only thing I can mention is Twisted Reunion is on sale right now in the U.S. and U.K. for 99 cents I think for the next five days or so. The audiobook is also on sale. Chirp, Spotify, Barnes & Noble. I think that's $2.99. Get it now while it's still on sale. Anyhow, thank you guys for listening. Yeah, jump on Kindle Bella. If you haven't checked it out, that would be awesome. That would be amazing if you went and checked out trying not to die back at grandma's house and trying to die in the wild west i believe when you sign up don't quote me on this but when i signed up they give me a certain amount of free tokens so you can use those on my episodes if you don't want to buy them and the first three episodes of both books are free anyhow and if you do read it please answer the poll at the end of each chapter yeah that'd be incredibly helpful and we would appreciate it all right guys i'm tired of talking i got a lot of shit to do I hope you have an incredible week and enjoy this short story. This is Group Session off a of Twisted Reunion, narrated by T. Quillen. All right, later. Group Session You sure you don't want me to stay, Dr. Hammond? I really don't mind. My mom can watch the kids till 8. Larry stopped rummaging through the filing cabinet just long enough to make eye contact with his overly sensitive blonde receptionist. I appreciate that, Lisa, but Wagner refuses to come in if anyone else is in the building. You know how some people feel about us. So they'd rather live an unhealthy life instead of risking embarrassment? He was tempted to say something mean and condescending, but ruled against it. Barton and Richter, the doctors he shared the practice with and who were both already on their way home, wouldn't like him abusing their precious little beauty. Larry had been pulling for a brunette, who actually had real experience. But Barton said that wasn't necessary in this line of work. Barton had the nerve to suggest that maybe after Larry had a few more years under his belt, he'd understand. So instead of saying something Lisa would take the wrong way, Larry resumed his search through the cabinet and said, At least this guy's coming. For every one of him, there must be a hundred others that couldn't be dragged in here by wild horses. I hadn't thought about it like that. It just seems like such an inconvenience for you. Wouldn't you rather go home on time and have dinner with your wife? Larry pulled out a folder and set it on top of the other two resting on the cabinet. Not knowing why he was telling her of all people, he said, Actually, that's the last thing I want. We're separating. There was that predictable look of surprise, accompanied by the gasping of air and her trademark, Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. Before he could utter another word, Larry looked at the clock in the deserted waiting room. It's 5.30 and they'll be here any minute. You really should get going before they show up. She gathered her belongings. I thought it was just Wagner. 
I talked him and two others into doing a group session. Should be interesting. Do I know the other two? Maybe, but you really need to hurry. Lisa looked hurt, but Larry didn't care. He'd be able to make a name for himself if tonight's session was a success. There would be papers, talk shows, maybe even a book. If some pretty girl's feelings got hurt along the way, then so be it. Larry's first client entered the office just moments after Lisa slipped out the back door. How are you doing, Mr. Petrowski? Larry held the inner office door open for the little man. Come on back. Frank Petrowski, a 48-year-old who looked closer to 60 thanks to his face, which resembled a piece of rawhide that had seen too many seasons, made his way past Larry and headed for the room. Although this was his fifth session with Frank, it was difficult holding back a smile. Standing 4'11", it was hard to take the man seriously. Larry told Frank to make himself comfortable, wasn't surprised to see him sit in the corner chair, avoiding the couch that would make him appear even smaller. When he heard the front door close, Larry excused himself to greet the so-called Honorable Alexander Steele. Always business, Steele brushed by him and said, I hope they're here. I've got things to do. I'm sure you do. Larry followed the bald, pot-bellied judge into the room, anxious to see how he would react to someone in his chair. Obviously perturbed, Steele grunted at Frank and huffed his way over to the couch. Just one more, gentlemen. He should be here shortly, Larry said before heading back to the receptionist's counter to gather their folders. The next few minutes were torturously slow. It wasn't quite six yet, but Wagner usually showed up early, as long as he was convinced the building was empty. Hopefully, the thought of talking to others hadn't scared him off. Without him, the session would be a bust. Three people composed a small group. Only two created an awkwardly confrontational setting, especially the two in the room now. And it wasn't the number of people present that necessitated Wagner's presence. There was something about the man that set him apart from the other patients. He was dealing with the same issues as Steele and Petrowski, but he was more willing to accept responsibility for his actions. Without him, there would be no group, no published paper, no TV show. Just as Larry was about to lose hope, the front door swung open. Evening, Mr. Wagner. I was afraid you wouldn't come. The muscular 30-year-old looked around the empty waiting room and peeked into the receptionist's area. Everybody gone? Yep. Just me and the other two men I told you about. Wagner seemed unusually tense, so Larry asked, You okay? Wagner said he was fine, but Larry didn't buy it. He locked the front door, hoping to take away some of the man's anxiety. You mind if we take care of the payment up front? Wagner pulled a wad of bills from his pocket. I got some stuff to handle after this. Larry waved away Wagner's money. This one's on the house. I expect the session to be very productive, but until we've tried it out once or twice, I wouldn't feel comfortable charging for it. The only thing I ask is that I be permitted to use any material in future papers or books. Of course, I will change all names to protect identities. Wagner shrugged his shoulders and slipped the thick roll back into his tan pants. And whatever. It seemed like some type of thanks was in order, considering he had just saved the man a hundred dollars. But Larry let it slide. As he led the way down the hallway, he asked, Have you had a chance to look into any insurance yet? wouldn't want the cost of treatment to prevent you from coming. Money's not an issue. Good, Larry said as they entered the office, reminding himself to jot down a question for next week's private session with Wagner. How is money not an issue for an unemployed ex-cop three years off the force? Wagner took a seat on the couch next to Steele while Larry rolled his chair out from behind the desk, positioning it so Wagner was in front of him, Frank off to his left. He noticed Steele checking his watch and apologized to the group for the delay, even though it was only four minutes past six. I've brought the three of you together because you're dealing with similar issues, and there's no support groups out there for you. I'm trained, just as most psychologists and therapists are, to give you insight into some of your problems. But this is a subject that the medical community has not studied sufficiently. That's why it might be helpful to talk with peers who were going through the same thing. 
Larry hoped the others hadn't noticed the judge rolling his eyes behind his glasses at the mention of peers. This is going to be a very informal discussion where each of you will get the chance to tell the group about yourself and ask questions of each other. I'll facilitate as needed, but this will be your time. Why don't we start with your names? With everyone acting as if they were at a seventh grade dance, Larry pointed at Frank and said, How about we start over here? Frank shot him an unpleasant glance, but predictably obeyed orders. I'm Officer Petrowski. Larry followed Wagner's eyes to Petrowski's waist, where they were probably searching for a badge or a gun that verified the diminutive man's claim. Frank seemed to sense the doubt and clarified, CO over at Sussex One State Prison in Waverly. I think this might be smoother if we're less formal. Larry told him. Well, then I guess you guys can call me Frank. I'm used to using last names. I, I don't think I could name three co-workers by their first names. Well, I know the feeling. Wagner chipped in, his earlier tension visibly reduced. I was a cop in Richmond for four years. Name's Charles Wagner. Charlie's fine. Thanks, Charlie. Larry turned to the oldest in the group. And last but not least, Judge Steele. Before Larry could ask for his first name, the judge grudgingly said, Alexander. Not Alex, but Alexander. So, we've got Frank, Charlie, and Alexander. Please call me Larry. Now, what do you say we get started? Larry took the group's silence as a green light. Everyone here has been having a difficult time dealing with their role in death. That said, let's get into specifics. Tell us why you're here, why you've sought treatment. Alexander, will you please start? I came because my wife said I should. Larry realized the man wasn't going to say anything more if not prompted. And why did she suggest you come in? Alexander glared at Larry. We've been over this. But not with them. You don't have to go into detail, just an overview. Alexander thought about it for a second. Well, I'm a judge. I've condemned people to die. Sometimes it bothers me. He mumbled. It was a start. Larry nodded his head and motioned for Charlie to go next. Well, I've been forced to take lives more than once, but the guilt I feel about one in particular has been a little too much, I suppose. Good, we'll go into that death leader. Larry jotted a note on Charlie's folder. Frank, your turn. Well, like I said before, I'm a CO over at Sussex One. I'm on the execution squad. Sometimes it's too much, like Charlie said. Speaking to no one in particular, Larry said, Just so you all know, each of you has confided in me the amount of stress these deaths have caused you. I ask that no one diminishes their experiences now that the others are present. Be assured you are all men and have dealt with your positions and responsibilities remarkably well. You have some of society's most demanding jobs, and you are forced to deal with psychological and moral issues. Feeling guilty or ashamed of things you've done is natural. Not being affected would lead me to believe there was something wrong. Tonight, you need to give these feelings voice. No one will laugh or think less of you. This is a healing process, and with that comes pain. Welcome it. Don't avoid it. Larry gave his speech a moment to set in before asking, Frank, can you tell us more about your problem? Um, like, like what? Larry checked his watch. At this rate, they'd be here till daybreak. Well, why don't you start by telling us about your job? What exactly do you do on this team? Well, I'm on strap down. The duties are a little different depending upon whether we're burning or sticking. What's that? Larry asked. Strap down? No, the burning or sticking. Electric chair or lethal injection. They get a choice. How nice. Charlie said. That's one hell of a decision to make. 
At least they only got to make it once, Frank said. But anyway, like I was saying, I'm on strap down, so I walk the guy in and strap him down to the table or chair and watch. Kind of like in the Green Mile or that, that one with the colored girl and that retarded guy from Sling Blade. Hoping to avoid any racial discussions, Larry said, Monster's Ball. Well, that doesn't sound like it. Uh, something else. This one had that girl. Uh, the one that's not so bad looking for, you know, being dark and all. Halle Berry, yes. Uh, Monster's Ball, trust me. Even though the discussion had gotten sidetracked, Charlie seemed intrigued. You stay until the guy's dead? Frank nodded. Even after? We get the pleasure of unstrapping him and rolling him out. The judge surprised them all by speaking. How long have you been doing this? I've been the CO for 29 years, on the execution squad for 28 of them. Alexander asked, Did you volunteer for this position? Well, the warden handpicks the team. Of course, you can withdraw or decline any time. Larry saw where this was headed, but the judge had already started his question. So why do it? If you ask me, you only have yourself to blame. If putting murderers to death bothers you so much, then maybe you need a new line of work. Frank was defending himself before Larry could come to his aid. I can handle it. I do handle it. But, but it's hard. I've helped kill 51 people in the last six years, and I've got another 35 waiting their turn after getting condemned in court. So now it's my fault? Well, someone's sending these guys to me. I don't go out there and find them on the street. Alexander shook his head. Judges don't sentence people to death. I understand that, Frank said. But I also understand that a judge has a great deal of influence over the jury. We're second in the nation, only behind Texas. They'll kill you over there for jaywalking. Frank cracked his knuckles. So if you're such a fair and just judge, then why are you here? You said you've condemned people to die. Only in a manner of speaking. Larry held up his hand to halt the discussion. We're not here to pass judgment on one another. We're not here to attack. We're here to listen. Alexander, tell them what you told me before. It's okay. Alexander pulled a monogrammed handkerchief from his pocket and wiped the sweat off his forehead. He sighed. I, I do encourage the death penalty when I believe it's warranted, and I guess I can influence juries. Frank nodded. But believing a man should die doesn't make putting him to death any easier to accept, right? Uh, I, I can't sleep some nights. I wonder if I've made the right decision. If I should be playing God. I wonder if we failed as a society when a decision like that rests in the hands of so few. After a small lull, Larry stepped in. So, Charlie, why don't you tell them some of the things that you're going through? You don't have to give specifics. Uh, focus on your feelings. How it's affected you. Charlie cleared his throat. Sometimes I have difficulty sleeping, too. Almost every night since my revelation. Charlie rubbed his thighs and began to rock. It's not because of the lives I've taken, though. This was just a one-time thing. But once was more than enough. I helped kill a man that didn't deserve to die. When was this? Frank asked. Over ten years ago. I was only nineteen. Frank said, You have to be twenty-one to be a cop. I wasn't a cop yet. Larry reminded Charlie that doctor-patient privileges only went so far, but this guy had been a cop and knew that. Alexander asked the question. You murdered a man? Charlie's rocking became more pronounced. I'm, I might as well have. It's okay, Charlie. Try to relax, Larry said. I was called for jury duty. First time I'd, I'd even heard of a jury. 
Anyway, I got selected for the trial of Gregory Watkins, Murder One. I remember him, Frank said. The colored guy. He got stuck a few years ago. For a while, it seemed like he'd never leave the row. Alexander said, Gregory Watkins, if I remember correctly, that psycho killed over 20 people, all women and children. He wrote on them, too, carved messages on their backs. Uh, Judge Hall ruled on that one. Hall? He's a friend of yours? Charlie asked. Well, more like an acquaintance, but we get along. If you ever see him again, you can thank him for screwing up my life. What are you talking about, son? First off, I'm not your son or anyone else's. Charlie's hands had become fists. Oh, it's just a manner of speech, Alexander said, his hard edge softened by Charlie's aggressive attitude. What Frank was saying about a judge's influence? Let's just say that Hall practically forced us to give him the death penalty. Well, I, I doubt that. You weren't there. Larry jumped in and asked, You don't think he deserved the death penalty? Absolutely not, Charlie said. Well, then how was the vote unanimous? Frank wondered. At the time, we all thought he was guilty. Back then, I was still a kid. I believed everything they showed us in court. Now I know better. Frank's furrowed brow showed he didn't understand. He killed those people. I talked to him about it. Said he had to. Wouldn't even say he was sorry when the needle went in. He was one unremorseful son of a bitch. Alexander said he'd read the same thing in the paper. This guy was guilty. You feel worse about condemning an admitted murderer than you do about shooting a criminal in the street? Charlie looked confused. I, I, I never once fired my weapon. Frank said, what about all those lives you said you had to take? Are you trying to tell us you actually beat people to death? Did you use your baton? You were kicked off the force for brutality, Alexander guessed. I quit. I never brutalized anyone on the job, never once, he said, outraged at the suggestion. So you were lying? Frank hoped. Charlie jumped to his feet. I don't lie! He yelled. You all lie. Society lies. My parents lied. I don't lie. Larry inched up from his chair. No one had ever acted like this in a therapy before. He was almost too scared to wish he had thought of videotaping the session. Easy, Charlie. Uh, take it easy and, and have a seat. You sit down, Larry. Now. Larry flinched and slid back down into his chair. This is my office. Not anymore, Larry. Stop saying my name like that. Charlie didn't sit down, but seemed to calm down a notch. It's about time you start being a professional. Why go by your first name? Are you supposed to be our goddamn friend? Frank stood in his best I'm-in-charge voice. He said, That's enough. Now sit down and relax, or... Charlie glanced at him. Or what? Or you can leave. Yeah, there's, there's three of us. You're threatening me? No one is threatening anyone, Larry said. A Napoleonic racist, a condescending prick judge. Alexander didn't get off the couch. Watch it, son. Charlie wheeled on the old man and slapped him so hard his glasses went flying off. I'm no one's son. Frank took a step toward Charlie, but stopped the moment Charlie turned toward him. Frank said, You can't do that. That's assault. The judge fumbled for his glasses, now somewhere on the floor. Larry tried to calm the melee. Nah, that's enough, everyone. Let's just calm down. Charlie wasn't having it. With one step, his chest was pressed against Frank's nose. I said, sit down. Now. Frank stood his ground, but couldn't control his trembling. Charlie took a small step back, lulled Larry into thinking his rage had subsided. 
Then he threw a devastating elbow down and across Frank's nose. The CO crumbled to the floor, curling up with both his hands to his bloody face. Larry scrambled to his desk, but Charlie yelled at him before he could pick up the phone. Charlie said, Don't do it, Larry. You don't want to do that. Larry turned, saw Charlie kneeling over Frank. Charlie had a switchblade. Charlie, you need to listen to me. Look what you are doing. Frank tried to rise up, but Charlie applied pressure to his neck. More blood leaked into the expanding pool. I didn't say you could get up. Larry said, He needs a doctor. You're a doctor, and you're not helping. And you're not a murderer. You're just upset. Let me call for help. No one's calling anyone, Larry. None of us deserves to be saved. He's bleeding, Charlie. Look at him. Yeah, the carpet will need to be replaced. Charlie saw Larry's hand. If you pick up that phone, there will be a price. What do you want, Charlie? What do you hope to... Alexander yelled at him. Don't try to reason with this sick bastard. A huge smile spread across Charlie's cheeks. He's right, you know. I'm not reasonable. The judge slid his butt toward the edge of the couch. We can fight him. Charlie laughed maniacally. He raised the blade, and Larry charged, lowered his shoulder, and tackled him off of Frank. The two rolled into the wall. Charlie's breath was warm against Larry's neck. Larry pulled himself off of Charlie and saw his eyes wild and filled with pain. Larry looked down, saw the knife, and shoved it into his patient's chest. Oh, God! Larry said, realizing what he'd done. Charlie's lungs were filling with blood. He leaned into the knife. Hey, Doc, Charlie gasped. Now you're one of us. <laughs>